Okay, we will uh, look, start on a new topic that uh, probably I will spend a few sessions on, uh, talking about the foundation of faith. And uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be based around Hebrews 6, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Uh, I'm not going to start on that today because I first, before we get there, I want to kind of um, lay a foundation for the foundation, double foundation kind of. So I want to take something today that will kind of prepare us for what we are going to be talking about the next times. But uh, in for, for the next uh, sessions, we will be talking about our number of subjects that uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, mentions as uh, basic uh, teachings for the Christian faith. So it's kind of like the foundation. And the reason why these topics are interest interesting is because, of course, the Bible itself talks about these topics as foundation. So when the Bible itself tells us that this is uh, foundational teaching, uh, then we know that we are on pretty uh, solid ground when it comes to assuming that the topics that then is mentioned, that they are important. Uh, so we will be talking about a number of different topics. We will be talking about faith, we will be talking about uh, repentance, about baptism, uh, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we will be talking about uh, laying on of hands, about uh, the resurrection of the dead, uh, uh, eternal rewards uh, or judgment, uh, a lot of different things that th the writer of uh, the epistle to the Hebrew says are fundamental teachings for our faith. But before we get there, I'm going to be talking about something today. Uh, uh, and let me also just say that right away. When we talk about uh, foundational teaching, I know there is a tendency uh, for many Christians to, to get this attitude. Ah, it's foundational teaching. Oh, yeah, I know this. And, and then you kind of disconnect. Uh, that's, a, that's a grave mistake. Because I think if there is something we really need to be talking about and studying about, not only superficially, but really dig deep uh, into, it is the foundational teaching. Because when people, when they get off, off track, like the last times, we, uh, two, two last times we have been talking about deception, you know, the reason why people get off track, usually it is never because of the foundational teaching, but it's because of a lack of foundational teaching. They maybe get a big interest in some kind of uh, topic that uh, maybe the Bible mentioned a little bit about and then suddenly they make a little bit of the truth and they make that the whole truth. Uh, there are topics in the Bible that the Bible talks a lot about and there are some topics that the Bible maybe just mentions one or two times and we need to focus on the basic. We need to major on the main, uh, on the major topics in the Bible. Those are the ones that will make our faith strong. Uh, when we talk about foundation, uh, we know that a building is never stronger than, than the foundation that the building is standing upon. So if uh, putting that into uh, the perspective of faith, your faith is not stronger than what, what the foundation for your faith is. Uh, when you face the hardship of life, uh, it's maybe interesting to know a lot about, you know, some things that the Old Testament writes about the tabernacle or some laws or maybe some, uh, about some special angels or Nephilims or some kind of things. They might be interesting, but it's not those things that are going to help you through uh, the hard times in life. What makes your faith strong is how grounded you are when it comes to the basic of faith. Uh, and we want to start by reading in Matthew 7. Uh, 
Uh, and we are going to read there from verse 24 to 27. So Matthew 7, 24 to 27, there Jesus is saying, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descend, descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and, uh, and great was, the, was its fall. It's kind of interesting to see here that Jesus says that he, he talks about building a foundation. Uh, and he talks about building on the rock, something that is solid, something that is strong. But what, what I think many people miss when they read this passage is that Jesus, th th I think very often we miss the main point of what Jesus was saying here. Because he is saying that whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, he is the wise man. He who hears the sayings and does not do anything with it. They are the fools. They who hear the words and do something about it. They are the wise men. When we talk about you know, the foundation of faith or theology, we, we are not only talking about like, theological doctrines uh, kind of, and that our faith is kind of built on some uh, theological beliefs. No. When it comes to the foundation, our faith, uh, we are not stronger. Our faith is not stronger uh, than what we actually practice when it comes to our belief. It's not enough when, it, when we are talking about the foundation here. It's not enough just to know something about a certain topic. No, that's not how our faith works. Our faith is not stronger. Or stronger than what we actually do with our faith. And we will looking a little bit on this uh, today. Uh, Jesus is telling us in plain words that the building of our life on the rock uh, is not just about hearing the word, but it's about doing the word. And I think that is so important when it comes to our faith, because it is so easy today that we listen to a lot of teachings and we see it on YouTube or Facebook or wherever we are and, and we fill our minds with teaching after teaching after teaching and we get into the habit of kind of saying, oh, I like that, I, I don't like that and then, then we listen to something and we say, oh yeah, that, that is probably, I pr should probably pray more, but then we don't pray. Then we listen to some teaching maybe about uh, healing and we say, oh yes, I should probably be praying more for the sick, but then we don't pray for the sick. And we get into a, a habit where, where we make it okay just to listen. But according to Jesus, that is being foolish. If you listen to Bible teaching and don't do anything with it, according to Jesus, you are a fool. I mean, I'm sorry to say, uh, but that is Jesus' word. It's not only about hearing, it's about your belief, it's about how it affects your life, how it changes the way that you live. And we see that again and again in the Bible, that faith, what activates faith is when we act upon what we believe. The power of faith. The, the, the way that the power of faith is activated is when belief and action comes together. Then the power of faith is activated. We see this in the life of uh, Jesus many times. You can see in the notes, for instance, when Jesus turns water into wine, uh, the servants, they see Jesus putting dirty water into the jars, and then he tells them, take it to the chef. They knew that they were carrying dirty water to the chef for the chef to taste that dirty water. I mean, 
I don't know about you, but you know, that's, that's uh, not a good idea unless um, a miracle happens. Because if it had stayed dirty water, I'm sure that the chef would be uh, mightily offended. So they did an act of faith. And the power of faith was released in them carrying, doing something with what Jesus had told them. When Jesus cleansed the ten leopards, uh, lepers, uh, he tells them to go to the high priest. They knew that if, if they, with leprosy, went to the high priest, they could be killed. That, uh, that was not allowed for them to present themselves to, to the high priest or to the priests. But Jesus, still Jesus, before they are healed, he is asking them to take a step of faith and then the power of faith is released when their belief in what Jesus was saying was combined with actually acting, doing something. Uh, when Jesus healed the man who was born blind uh, in John 9, again we see how Jesus, before he receives his sight, Jesus tells him to do something. Because there is power in the, the power of faith is released when we when we do something about what we believe. And I think that's so important when it comes to our Christian walk to understand that when we are talking about the foundation of faith, when we are talking about uh, the foundation uh, for our Christian walk, it is not empty knowledge. It's not just learning a set of doctrines or creed. It is about hearing something Believing it and then putting it into action. And it, it's not until it's being put into action that power is released. That's how we release the power of faith. It is taking what we believe, combining it with an action, and then uh, the power of faith is released. Uh, and I, th I think this is a a uh, truth that many people, many Christians so often miss. Maybe because we have had some unhealthy teaching when it comes to taking uh, steps of faith and then you do something foolish, hoping that God will do a miracle. That's not what we are talking about. But just because somebody has misused the, the issue of taking steps of faith, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. No, there is a biblical truth and biblical power connected to taking steps of faith and understanding that the power of our faith is being released when we live out our faith. That's when the power of our faith is being released. It's very interesting to, to read uh, uh, James's epistle or the letter of James and see how James, uh, we know that Martin Luther, he actually wanted to remove uh, the letter of James because he felt it contradicts uh, the teaching of saved by grace. But as we will see today, there is no contradiction here. It's just how we understand faith. But James says in James 1.22, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. We talked about that when we were talking about deception. You know, if you only hear the word and you think you know something about healing because you have heard teaching about healing, then you don't really know it. You don't really know something about healing until you have actually lived it out, put it into practice. Then you can say that you know something about healing. And it's very interesting, but when you read James chapter 2, James has this uh, several verses. I encourage you to read the whole chapter 2. Uh, we will not do that now for the sake of time, but it's very interesting to see how, how James is connecting the issue of faith with works. And some have misunderstood this to be work-based Christianity. That's not what James is talking about. He's just saying that if you truly have faith, there will be corresponding actions to that faith. And unless those corresponding actions are there, 
you don't truly have faith. He says in James chapter 2, 22, talking about Abram, he says, Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. I want to read that again. Do you see, he's talking about Abram here. He says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. There was something in the combination of faith and acting upon that faith that made faith perfect. And I think that is so important when it comes to understanding the foundation of our faith. Because today, very often, people will say, yes, I believe in Jesus. And then you will ask them, well, what do you mean? Well, well I believe that Jesus was a man that lived 2,000 years ago. Uh, so yes, I believe in Jesus. Or maybe some take it a step further and says, uh, uh, I believe in Jesus. And you will ask them, okay, what do you mean? And they will say, well, I believe that Jesus is alive. So, so I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is real. Well, if I ask you, do you believe in Donald Trump? Oh, that's a very touchy issue today to talk about politics, especially if you mention Donald Trump. Uh, oh, maybe I got your attention now. But you know, if I ask you, do you believe in Donald Trump? Some people will say very enthusiastically, yes, we believe in Donald Trump. Some people will say, I absolutely do not believe in Donald Trump. If I then ask you, okay, if you don't believe in Donald Trump, don't you believe that he exists? Oh, yeah, of course, I believe, I believe, I know he exists. I just don't believe in what he say. If I ask you, do you believe in Darwin? Many people, they will think, oh, okay, the, uh, the theory of evolution. And they will say, no, I don't believe in Darwin. Well, don't you believe that Darwin existed? Say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, I believe he existed, but I just don't believe in him. I, just, I don't believe in what he says. You know, it's the same thing with Jesus. When we say, I believe in Jesus, or when the Bible talks about believing in Jesus, it doesn't talk about believing that Jesus exists. James 2.19 says that even the devil believe that Jesus exists and the devil is not saved. I hope that didn't come as a revelation to you. But you know, when the Bible talks about believing in Jesus, it doesn't talk about believing in his existence. It talks about counting him trustworthy, believing in who he was and what he said. And when we talk about our Christian faith, we need to understand that when we talk about believing in Jesus, believing in the Bible, it's not believing that God exists or that there is more between heaven and earth than most other places. No, when we talk, it's, it is a trust. It is believing that Jesus is who he said he is and believing that Jesus, what Jesus said is the truth. And when we, when we start to understand this, then it becomes very obvious that if that's what faith is, believing in what Jesus said, believing in who he was, counting him to be trustworthy, then it is meaningless to say that you have faith or that you believe in Jesus if you actually don't do what he says. It's kind of like if you believe in me, if I ask you, do, do you believe in me? Hopefully, you will say, yes, I believe. Uh, and you were standing in the middle of the road, and I was shouting to you, get out of the road, there is coming a car. And you turn around to me and say, yes, Ronald, I believe in you. Yes, that's good, I believe. And you keep standing in the road. I will think, you are crazy. Do you wish to die? If you, believe, if you keep standing in the road, that would basically mean that you didn't really believe what I said. Because if you really believed what I said when I was shouting to you, get out of the road, there is coming a car, you would be jumping out of that road. 
If I would be telling you uh, the next one who goes to my car, he will get one million dollars. I could easily see who would believe that and who not. Because if you kept sitting and didn't do anything about it, I would understand you didn't really believe me. But those who got up and went as fast as possible to my car to get that million dollars, I would understand. They are the ones who believe, believe in me. That's what it means when the Bible talks about faith. It's not, a, it's not believing that God exists. Even the devil believes that God exists. He knows that better than any of us, that God is real, that he exists. When we talk about faith in God, faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus, we are talking about not only believing in his existence, but counting him to be trustworthy to such a degree that when he says something, then we believe it. How can you see that I believe what Jesus says if I actually live it out? And you know, there is a very interesting thing. You know, today we put a lot of emphasis on being saved by grace. And of course, we are saved by grace. Yet, there is many people who misunderstand this. It's very interesting. Some years ago, I wrote on Facebook, I, I asked a question. I said, are we saved by grace or through faith? And it was very interesting to see the discussion that got started. You know, people, some said that, uh, no, we are saved by grace. And other people said, no, 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 it's through faith. And you had a big discussion going. Of course, those who said that we are saved by grace, they were probably thinking of Ephesians 2.8. But, you know, those who said that we are saved through faith, they were probably also thinking about Ephesians 2.8. The thing is that today we have put a very big emphasis on grace and maybe in many cases we have misunderstood what the verse actually says. Because, and this, this might shock some of you, but you know, Ephesians 2.8 doesn't say that it's grace that saves us. I want to repeat that. Ephesians 2.8 doesn't say that it's grace that saves us. Let me prove it to you. Let us read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And now maybe you need to take off your, how to say, glasses, your grace glasses, and try to, re try to read this as you are hearing it for the first time. Try to kind of wipe your mind clean and try to listen to this verse now for the first time and, and hear what Paul is saying. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, what did he say? He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. So what Paul is saying is that we are saved through faith but that we now have the opportunity of being saved through faith. That is not something we deserve. That is by grace. So Paul is saying that we are saved through faith and that we now have the opportunity of being saved through faith. That is not something we deserve. In the Old Testament, there were a whole lot, bunch of laws and regulation and all kinds of things that they had to do to get saved. Now, in the New Covenant, we are saved by faith. That is not something we deserve, so it's by grace. Grace means uh, unmerited favor, uh, some, that we are getting something that we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be saved simply by putting our trust in Jesus Christ. We don't deserve that. So it is by grace, yes. But Grace is not the medicine that saves us. Faith is the medicine that saves us. And that's very interesting because when we are going to be looking at uh, Hebrews 6 and going through this kind of list of verses that is mentioned as the foundation of faith, 
it's very interesting to, un, to notice that faith is mentioned before repentance. We often think that it starts with repenting, and then we start to believe, and then we are saved. But actually, according to Hebrews 6, it starts by hearing something that we believe, in other words, faith, and as a response to what we hear, we repent. So it doesn't start with repenting, no, it starts with believing something. And because of what we have heard, the response to that is repentance. But we will talk more about that later. It's, it's even clearer when you read Romans 5 that it is faith that is the medicine. Because in Romans 5, 1 and 2, Paul is saying, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Did you notice what he said? He said that we have access by faith into grace. So what gives me access into the grace of God? Faith. It is faith that grants me the access into the faith of God. If people got, if grace was the medicine that saves us, then everybody would be saved. Then even the Satanist would be saved, the Buddhist, the, uh, anyone would be saved. Because God is gracious towards all people. God is a gracious God. If it was grace alone that saved us, then everybody would be saved. But yet that's not what the Bible say, teaches. It teaches that when we believe, we get access into the, then we get, can experience the grace of God. And you know, there are, in some kind of way, it's strange that many people so easily today say, oh, we are saved by grace, and then they don't really maybe think, what, what does that really mean? That we are saved by grace doesn't mean that we can live however we want and still be saved. That's not what grace means. The Bible tells us that it's by faith, believing in Jesus. That's what gives us the access. So when we talk about uh, the foundation of uh, our faith or of Christianity, we, we are, it's a faith-based religion, not a faith believing that God exists or that Jesus is real, but a faith, a trust in that he is who he says he is and that I can trust what he says. John 3.16, we know, hopefully we know that verse, John 3.16, For so God loved the world that he gave his only uh, Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Uh, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because uh, they have not believed. Do you see faith coming again and again? Believe, believe, believe. Acts 10, 43, all the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him, receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Again, you see, believing in him, getting access to the grace or the forgiveness for sins. Romans 3.22, the right, uh, this righteousness is giving, given through grace. No, that's not what it says. This righteousness is giving, given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. We maintain that, a, oh, and verse 28, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians 3.22, but scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given 
true faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. There are countless scriptures showing that the medicine that saves us is our faith, us believing in Jesus. That's the medicine and that, that's the foundation that we build our faith upon. It is our trust in Jesus. That's kind of the, 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 the rock that we, we are not only hearing what Jesus says, but we are believing it so much that we actually do something. We make it a part of our lives. And we, when we make it a part of our life, that's the proof that we truly believe it. And then power is released, the power of faith, and we get ex access into the uh, grace of God. The reason why I, I want to, how to say, put an emphasis on this now in the start, before we start on Hebrews 6, is because I think it's so, so important that we understand this, that when we talk about Christianity, when we talk about our faith, it is not only a matter of believing some doctrines or some creeds, or it's definitely not only believing that God is real, that God exists, that there is a supernatural world, spiritual world. Being a Christian is not only about believing that Jesus is real, no, it is counting Jesus trustworthy. And because you count him trustworthy, because you believe in him, you actually take what he says and you make it a part of your own life. And your whole Christian walk is based on counting Jesus to be trustworthy. So when Jesus says, if I confess my sin, he will forgive them. I believe that. Do I always feel it? No, I don't always feel it, but I count him to be trustworthy. So if he says, if I confess my sins, if I repent, I will be forgiven, okay, then I trust that. And then I live as if I am forgiven. Why? Because I count him to be trustworthy. If he says that he will provide for my needs, then I live as if he would provide for my need. If, he, if I believe that he is my healer, then I live as if he is my healer. If I believe the promises of God when it comes to prayer, then I pray and I live as if I believe in the power of prayer. And when my belief is being incorporated into my life, into my lifestyle, into the way I live, then power is released. At the end here, I want to read Matthew 16, which is a very, very important verse or passage uh, when it comes to understanding the foundation of our faith. And I want to read actually from verse 13 to 19. It's a longer passage, but I think we will take the time to read it because it's, it's such an important passage. Uh, Matthew 16, and we read from verse 13 to 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others uh, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? That was probably one of the most important questions that the disciples got. But who do you say I am? And I think that's the most important question that you can answer for your sake. Who, what, who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? And then Peter steps up. Peter has one of his Eureka moments. Uh, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What was the revelation that Peter had gotten? It was that Jesus was the Messiah, the living Son of God. Then Jesus says something interesting. He said that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, this knowledge, this revelation that Peter had acquired, that Jesus was the, was the Christ, the Son of the living God, that was not something that he could read himself to, study, read a book, and he would understand it. No, this was something that had to be given to him. That means that it's just as easy for a little child to be saved as for an adult. Maybe probably it's easier for the little child than for the adult because children generally has very easy of trusting. When, when the parents say something, they easily trust what the parent says. Jesus says that this revelation is something that has to be given to him. Faith is not built on, upon a theoretical knowledge that Jesus is real. Faith is built upon the revelation of who Jesus is and what he has done. In, in Greek, uh, the word Christ, it's the same word that in Hebrew, in Hebrew you would say Messiah, in Greek you would say Christ. It's the same words, just two different languages. If we would say it in English, we would say the anointed one. So Hebrew, Messiah, Greek, Christ, English, the anointed one. What in the world does the anointed one mean? To be anointed basically just means that you have been given the ability. So when somebody was anointed king, he was given the ability to be king. When somebody is, has a healing anointing, it means that they has a, have an ability to heal. When somebody has a prophetic anointing, they have an ability to prophesy. When somebody has an, an evangelistic anointing, they have an ability when it comes to the to evangelism. Anointing basically just means that you have the ability. And then the question is, so what, what does it mean when he says that Jesus is the, is the Christ? He doesn't say that he is just a Christ, but he says he is the Christ. Singular. Matthew 1, 21 when the angel comes and announces the birth of Jesus, he will say, uh, you will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And then he says, for he will save his people from their sins. So what was it that Jesus was anointed to do? He was the one who has been anointed to save. He is the one who is the Christ. The one who is the Messiah, the one who is the anointed one. What does that mean? It means that he has an ability. What does he has an ability to do? To save, to forgive sins. He is the one that is sent by God. He died for our sins and he was raised, to, raised from the dead, showing that he is the one who is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one that is able to once and for all deal with man's biggest problem, the problem of sin. You say, well, isn't war man's big biggest problem or hunger or uh, crime or uh, disease? Isn't that man's biggest problem? No, all of those things are just an effect 
of the real problem. The real problem is sin. Wars, hunger, poverty, they are just effects of that one problem. Jesus is the one who has been anointed to save us. We will end here. I just want to, before we end, just highlight this fact again, that it is not about theoretical knowledge, but it is about a revelation. A revelation is stronger than knowledge. It is, it is not only theoretically knowing something, it is having the experience, you have, have experienced it. It is real to you. It's not only something that you have in your head, it is something that is in your heart. Our faith is based not upon a theoretical knowledge of Jesus as an historical person, or even the knowledge that maybe he has been raised from the dead. Our faith is not based upon believing that there is a God. No, our faith is based upon us believing that Jesus is who he said he is. We count him to be trustworthy, and because we count him to be trustworthy, we take what he says and we start to live it out. Why? Because we count him to be trustworthy. We believe in him, and because we believe in him, we do something with the things that he says, says to us. Let me end just with one scripture, John 5, 39 to 40. It says that Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. The Pharisees are like many Christians are today. They think the magic is just in studying the Bible, studying the Bible, studying the Bible. And I know this probably sounds completely like heresy, but you know, it's not only about studying the Bible, studying the letters in the Bible, but it is about the relationship with the author. The relationship with the author makes studying the Bible come alive. It is the relationship that we have with the author the revelation that we have of him, who he is. It's, the relation, it's our revelation of him that makes the Bible come alive. And you know, you can read the Bible for years and not really understand who God is. You only start to realize who God is when you get the revelation that he gives to those who put their faith in him. That's why John 17, 3 says that this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. It's, it's not about knowing about God, it is about knowing God. And that is our foundation for faith. Our faith is based upon not theoretical knowledge, but it's based upon our revelation of who Jesus is. And it's not based upon head knowledge, but it's, it is counting him to be trustworthy. And because we count him to be trustworthy, we do what he says. And that's how faith and works comes together. It's not that I do works to get saved, but I do works because I listen to what he says. And because I believe him, I do what he says. And so works and faith comes together. Amen. So that's the foundation that we will build on and what we will be talking more about in the following when we are going to be going through Hebrew 6 and uh, different uh, things that Hebrew mentions. But... The foundation of it all is our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Amen? Amen.